Thanks in part to support from the National Institute for Healthcare Management Foundation. We're going to spend the next six episodes talking about vaccines. We're going to cover their discovery and the evolution of their use across history, how they exploit the intricacies of the immune system, the history of vaccine backlash and misinformation, and the relevance of all that in the middle of this global pandemic. Before we get to vaccination, though, we need to talk about variolation. That's the topic of this week's healthcare triage. Just over a century ago, both the infant mortality rate and the mortality rate for children under five years of age in the United States was 20%. A huge number of those deaths were due to diseases that are now preventable. For example, in 1916, measles killed almost 12,000 people in the United States, with 75% of them being under the age of five. In 1916, polio killed around 6,000 people in the United States and paralyzed thousands more. Summer polio epidemics were common in certain areas and led to widespread closure of places like parks and community pools. In 1921, we saw over 200,000 cases of diphtheria in the United States with 15,520 deaths. Globally, mortality rates for those under five years of age have been reduced by almost 60% since then, and much of that has to do with access to vaccines. It's been so long since these now preventable diseases ravaged the lives of our children, and these outbreaks are now mostly beyond living memory, which might be partly to blame for the growing number of people who are suspicious of vaccines and refuse to be vaccinated. But we'll dedicate a whole episode to the history of anti-vaccination sentiment. This episode's about the history of vaccines. Human innovation can be incredible, springing from unexpected sources, spurred by accidental discoveries, and sometimes mocked for a while before the significance really catches on. So how did we get to one of the greatest public health achievements of all time, the vaccine? A quick note before we begin. We'll be using three words a lot, inoculation, variolation, and vaccination. Inoculation is the practice of introducing an infectious agent into a scraped or otherwise absorptive part of the skin, like the mucous membranes in your nose, in the hopes of inducing immunity against that infectious agent. It's essentially plopping a live, full-strength pathogen right into your body, but in a controlled manner. Variolation specifically refers to inoculation with smallpox matter, because variola is the name of the virus that causes smallpox. And vaccination, of course, is what we know today, where a weakened version of a pathogen is introduced to the body to prepare the immune system for a potential encounter with the full-blown version of that pathogen later. It turns out that this is much safer than inoculation, though inoculation was safer than natural exposure. It's all about progress, and now we'll progress with this episode. Smallpox inoculation, or variolation, may have occurred as early as 200 BCE. Evidence describing the practice definitely dates back to at least the 1500s in China and India. An emperor in the late 1600s suffered smallpox in childhood and later had his children inoculated, which involved grinding up smallpox scabs and blowing it into their nostrils. Another method involved scratching material from a smallpox sore into the open skin of an uninfected person. These methods were employed in Africa and Turkey and later caught on in Europe and the Americas. The wife of a British ambassador to Turkey had been disfigured by smallpox and later had her son variolated in Constantinople, after which she wrote to a friend describing the women who would open people's veins with a large needle and then place inside the opening some smallpox matter that they carried around in a nutshell. She later introduced the practice in England, asking a physician to perform the procedure on her young daughter. The practice arrived in the Americas when a smallpox epidemic hit Boston in the 1700s. A man who learned of smallpox variolation when he saw a variolation scar on a Libyan-born man enslaved in his household began reading up on the practice and promoting it, urging a physician to perform the practice during the epidemic. Of the 248 people variolated, only six died. Variolation has its downsides, though. It was common for 2 to 3% of variolated individuals to die from smallpox. Though, to be fair, this was better than the 20 to 30% death rate of those who contracted the disease naturally. 
It's also important to note that variolation did not prevent a person from spreading smallpox to others. Benjamin Franklin was an avid promoter of the practice. John Adams underwent the procedure himself during a 1764 outbreak. Catherine the Great also underwent variolation. And in 1777, George Washington made it mandatory for troops in the Continental Army. He did this after a military operation against British troops failed due to a smallpox epidemic that reduced the number of American troops who were healthy enough to fight. The British troops didn't have this problem because they were all variolated. Then in 1796, Edward Jenner conducted the world's first scientific investigations of vaccination using cowpox material to induce smallpox immunity. Cowpox is a viral disease in cattle caused by the cowpox virus, and it is closely related to variola, the virus that causes smallpox. While it is now rare, it can be spread to humans via sores on an infected cow's skin. The story goes that a milkmaid told Jenner she caught cowpox from a cow and believed herself immune to smallpox because of it. Further evidence came from an English cattle farmer who inoculated his wife and two sons with cowpox lesion matter when a smallpox epidemic hit his village in 1774. They survived and later showed no symptoms when exposed to smallpox matter. It seems unclear if Jenner knew of the farmer's efforts, and though Jenner is credited with the first vaccination, the farmer's tombstone is inscribed with the first person known who introduced the cowpox inoculation. As a side note, Edward Jenner gives credit to his friend, physician Richard Dunning, for coining the word vaccination, arising from the Latin word for cow, which is vacca. Jenner's work, after some medical and technical alterations, eventually led to the eradication of smallpox and laid the foundation for vaccines as we know them today. Vaccination appeared much safer than inoculation. Thus, efforts to promote vaccination and discourage inoculation began in the early 1800s. In 1802, Massachusetts became the first U.S. state to endorse vaccination. In 1803, the practice was brought to South America when King Charles IV of Spain commissioned a physician to bring it to the Spanish colonies in the New World. And in 1840, Britain banned variolation and began offering free vaccinations for infants. And that's where we'll pick up next week. Hey, did you enjoyed this episode? We're going to make a whole playlist of all of the episodes in this series. In fact, you should subscribe to the show down below so you don't miss anything. I like the video too. We'd also like it if you go on over to patreon.com slash healthcare triage, where you can help support the show even during a global pandemic. We'd like to especially thank our research associates, James Glasgow, Joe Sevitz, Josh Gister, and Michael Chin, and of course, our Surgeon Admiral Sam.